thanks for all, all y'all for coming. Appreciate it. So uh, the first thing is, uh, uh, this is one of the 14ers in Colorado. It's a much better thing to look at than most of the other slides I'm going to show you. So uh, that's my brother. He, he was training for one of the, the Leadville 100 ultra marathon at the time, uh, which he did complete. Oh yeah, he's doing one this weekend. He's doing one this weekend. Yeah. So he's an idiot. So. Um, but uh, so we're going to talk about sep sepsis, and this is I give this talk quite a bit, um, and this is really to talk about. Uh, really want to answer four questions: Why do we care about sepsis? What is sepsis? How do we treat it? And what's the evidence to support it? I think as nurses. A lot of times we throw protocols and orders and all this stuff at you, and it's much more important to understand why we do that, because um, then it makes more sense. And that's my goal here. I could talk about this, like we could do a whole day of just sepsis. There's so much into this, so I've tried to really keep it uh, concise and kind of what I think is important. Um, the why is actually really easy. Does anybody know? I mean, give me a, somebody give me a good answer why we want to talk about sepsis today. High mortality. Yes, people die from sepsis. So, one in three patients who die in the hospital have sepsis. Right? So it's the highest mortality of anything we do in the hospital. It comes from sepsis. 1.7 million adults per year in the, in the U.S. Uh, will develop sepsis, 270,000 people die of sepsis each year. So, um, causes a lot of deaths. Third leading cause of death overall, heart disease and cancer are the two that are above it. Contributes to one in every two to three hospital deaths. And other things that cost a lot, $24 billion a year is estimated to be spent on sepsis care. It's the most expensive condition treated in U.S. hospitals. So, number five on that is heart attack. Right? So think about how, what we do with heart attacks. And I don't even think stroke makes that list. So that's pretty impressive that sepsis is the most expensive hospital condition. So it's really important that we figure out how to take care of this and we do it well. Because we're going to save lives, um, number one. And number two is that we can reduce hospital costs if we, if we uh, do it well. So I put this up here, and we'll get to this at the end. The other important things to know, and I don't think the nurses or most physicians in the hospital know that we track sepsis deaths at Kootenai very closely. I review all the mortalities from sepsis and septic shock at Kootenai. Our mortality rate uh, obviously ranges from anywhere upwards of 50% in a single quarter. Um, this is back in 2015. We've seen a pretty steady decline in this until this last quarter, and I think that some of this will come down because I don't think all the data is going to be included there yet, hopefully. But obviously we saw a jump up above that. Our target is this green line, and we've hit it maybe twice, okay, and that's about 20% mortality from septic shock patients, all right. In sepsis patients, or severe sepsis patients, we should see a mortality less than 10%. We're pretty good at that. So. History of sepsis, it's kind of interesting. It's been around a long time and people have known about it. It was introduced by Hippocrates back in 460 to 370 BC, derived from the Greek word sipsi, or make rotten, All right? And then back after uh, 979, 1037 after Christ, it's, you find that uh, uh, the coincidence of blood petrification and fever, septicemia, was noticed. But it really wasn't until the 1800s that somebody actually figured out maybe we could do something to decrease this. And this is an interesting story. I can't pronounce this guy's name, um, but he was a physician, worked in the OB unit, we'll call it the OB, where they were delivering babies. And he noticed that there was a difference in the mortality of women between those that were taken care of by midwives and those that were taken care of by students, medical students. And so they had a much higher mortality rate with the medical students. Some of you would say that's not surprising, but um, 
uh, what the medical students would do is that they do their anatomy lab, and then they go take care of women having babies. And he had this really strange idea. Maybe they should wash their hands. <laughs> and so he did a study back in the 1800s, washing hands, and saw the mortality rate drop from 18 to 2.5%. So that seems pretty good, huh? So you know what happened to him? He was told he was nuts, actually got put in an insane asylum. And uh, because this was obviously not the right answer, and uh, he died of like a wound infection and sepsis at the insane time. So, yeah, that's what I have to look forward to. Um, so, uh, again, you know, the history goes on. Um, they link sepsis to probably pathogenic bacteria, and that it was something in the blood that bacteria got into the blood and caused infection. It really wasn't until 1989 that we started to develop our modern. Uh, idea of what sepsis is. So in 1989, uh, Dr. Roger Bone said sepsis is defined as an invasion of microorganisms and or their toxins in the bloodstream, along with organism reaction against this invasion. And this led to the sepsis one di definition in 1991. They had a, you know, some really smart people got together um, and had a conference. And they, at these conferences, they make up stuff uh, that we now assume is the right definition, but they developed the SIRS criteria, which everybody should be familiar with. Uh, basically, temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, white blood cell count uh, as possible, or SIRS criteria. Sepsis equals two or more of these criteria with um, a uh, infection or suspected infection. Severe sepsis is sepsis plus organ dysfunction, and then septic shock is sepsis-induced hypotension despite adequate resuscitation. So that's a sepsis one definition. We have sepsis two definition that came out in 2001, which expanded on this definition, but made it a little bit more complex because they added in these diagnostic criteria for sepsis infection. You know, SIRS, alter mental status, hyperglycemia would be general things. Inflammation, again, with the uh, white count, high or low. You can use C-reactive protein, procalcitonin, things that we don't normally use these days. Uh, the hemodynamic changes, which would be with septic shock and severe sepsis, um, and then what that organ dysfunction was, decrease in urine output, PDF ratio, which is basically needing oxygen, ARDS, that type of thing. Put the count less than, actually should be 100, um, tissue perfusion. Started looking at lactate at, at this point. That was back in 2001. Most recently, we have the sepsis three definition that came out about 2016. This has been a pretty controversial, and it's not something we really have adopted completely. So sepsis one and sepsis two are really where, where we're still at. And then the sepsis three, which is interesting, um, and we'll probably be moving more towards this, but it's, again, it's pretty controversial. Most centers, including CMS, have not adopted it as a criteria for sepsis, but use a QSOFA score to, to um, screen for sepsis, which is altered mental status, blood pressure less than, systolic blood pressure less than 100, respiratory rate greater than 22. Those are the three criteria to screen for sepsis. A little bit different, right? Um, and you need to get two of those three. If you get two of those three on any patient that walks into the emergency room, you should be suspicious of sepsis. So a lot of people are like, well, that's the patients that come into the emergency room. But then you have to go on and say, and do what's called a SOFA score, and then a suspicion of infection, okay? Um, so it's not just the screening of the acute SOFA. You need to look further and say, okay, I think this patient's also infected. And then septic shock is circulatory and cellular, uh, cellular slash metabolic abnormalities, which may increase mortality. So that's when you're in shock, lactate's greater than two. Um, despite adequate fluid resuscitation. Any questions on that? Again, I'd focus on sepsis one and two, and someday we'll figure out how to incorporate sepsis three. But it's good to think about that patient that comes in the emergency room, 85-year-old with altered mental status, and they're breathing kind of fast, you should probably think about sepsis. It should set up some, some bells in there. But then you gotta go on and, and really and, and go after the diagnosis. So what do the definitions really mean? 
Uh, sepsis is a syndrome that is difficult to characterize, but very common, right? We know it happens a lot, but we still don't have a good definition of it, and there's no lab test for it. Um, we need de definitions to identify sepsis, sepsis screens, and those kind of things that we can put into computers so that they can, you know, set off some bells and whistles. Also, for research and quality improvement. But there really is no good definition of sepsis, and I'd say quit worrying about it. Um, there's not going to be one any time. If you start getting into details of it, and I've been at these meetings where people sit there and debate these definitions all the time. But really what you want is the big picture. Is the patient coming in, is they sick, and are they, or do you think they're infected? So recognize six patients that you think are infected and treat them. Don't think about it too hard. Don't get stuck in the details. So this is uh, from one of those uh, meetings where they talked about what sepsis is. And as you can see, sepsis, this goes back to this, the sepsis one and two definitions where you had shock, severe sepsis, and sepsis. But you can have infection without sepsis, and you can have SIRS without infection or um, sepsis. So trauma can cause SIRS, burns, those kind of things. But if you have a suspicion, go ahead and treat. The pathogenesis is really complicated. Um, people spend their whole lives studying this in labs and mice and rats and all other animals. They give them sepsis and look at it. And it's thought to be a, kind of an unbalanced immune reaction. You get, there's tissue factors that are involved. You get this procoagulant state and microvascular thrombosis when you cut into you know, somebody who's septic and look at, get uh, biopsies in their hands and their fingers. Remember they turn black sometimes, we see that in the ICU. A lot of that has to do with microvascular thrombosis that happens in the organs as well, the liver, the um, kidneys, and things like that. And so you see these microvascular thrombosis. And in fact, there's some data out there that shows that if you give somebody heparin, and septus, and septic shock, they do better. And that was the idea behind Zygris as well, which a lot of you probably don't know what Zygris is, but a long time ago we used to give it to a lot, some of us used to give it to a lot of people. Uh, can't get it on the market anymore. Um, so mediators and infl inflammation lead to vasodilation, production of reactive oxygen species, and capillary leaks. So they're fluid. You know, you get a vasodilation. They're for, I don't know, I see some of our heart nurses in here. The SVR goes down, their cardiac output goes up, um, and they become volume depleted because that fluid goes into their tissues. Okay. And this is uh, out of a... Uh, 2006 a review article which looked at and, and honestly this for our purposes really hasn't changed that much uh, you have uh, uh, LPS lipopolysaccharide which is would be one of the things you see with gram negative back of the cell they go in and they bind to what's called the toll like receptors and that sets off an inflammatory cascade NF kappa B is one of those inflammation markers that gets translocated from the cell surface into the um, nucleus and, and you get transcription, translation, transcription and translation of inflammatory uh, markers. Okay, and those things like TNF-alpha, interleukin-1 uh, beta, and then interleukin-10. All right? And then you get some other things, gram positives, get binding of peptoglycan, and that binds to like receptor 2, sets off the same thing, it all goes through this NF-kappa B, um, uh, modulator. You also get increased activity of INOS, okay, nitrogen oxygen species, and then increased nitrogen oxide, which leads to that vasodilation. And then um, uh, you can get release of prostaglandin, leukotrienes, and proteases and oxidants. That's probably more than we all want to know about it. It's kind of boring. But um, that's what happens in, from the big picture at the cellular level. But what's really important to us is what happens in sepsis and why people die. So people die because they develop organ failure. In this uh, study, they looked at all patients who presented with sepsis and looked at mortality versus number of organs that are failing. So mortality um, uh, here and then number of organs. So if you have no organ failure and you have sepsis, your mortality is really low. If you have four or more organs that have failed, uh, um, 
four more here, which is not very many patients, but your mortality is really high. Okay? So we don't like organ failure. And it's a nice little step up. And this is if you're doing research, you'd love to see something like this uh, and when you get your results. So decreasing patients, but increasing mortality, okay? It's with organ failure. Hypotension, you know, we measure lactate quite a bit in these patients. And so um, what you know is that patients who have hypotension and an elevated lactate, 42% mortality. If they just have a lactate alone that's elevated, still have 26% mortality. So you see an elevated lactate, you really should pay attention. And this is not all septic patients. These are just patients coming into the ED that have hypotension and you get a lactate. So, and, that, and that number is even with after treatment. Yeah, yeah. So I think in this study it was after. These are just patients presenting, mm -hmm. and they have an lactate greater than two, and then they're hypotensive, and that's their mortality. Okay, so I don't think that's necessarily after if you get them treated. I'm sure I have to go back and look at the paper and see if they got the data on how they did afterwards. This is all comers. Just remember, lactate is not death is not, uh, does not mean they have sepsis, it just means they're sick, okay? You can have trauma will cause lactate. Doing the Ironman, you measure people going across the finish line of the Ironman, they're lactated, every one of them is probably like eight, mine was probably 15. Um, so, uh, you know, but they're gonna clear it really fast, hopefully. But in sepsis, they may not. Now this didn't come out very well, but I would, you know, in the emergency room, I get this call all the time. Uh, they were, you know, so and so was hypotensive, but they look much better now. For me, if you ever tell me this patient's hypotensive in the emergency room, I'm going to actually pay quite a bit of attention. And this is one of the studies that shows why. So if you have um, hypotension and their lowest systolic blood pressure was less than 80, their mortality rate, and this is all comers, this is not sepsis, but any patient comes into the ED that had hypotension. Systolic blood pressure measured at some point in ED is less than 80, 18% mortality. Okay. Even if their blood pressure, you know, a lot of these patients come in 80 to 89, still 7% mortality. Okay. So I tend to perk up when somebody says they're hypotensive. If it's sustained hypotension in the ED, you know, systolic less than 100 for a sustained period of time, 14% mortality in those patients. All right, so if they have no hypotension, it's only three, if they have 3%. So hypotension is something you have to pay attention to, even one time, unless it was like, unless you can prove to me that it was a, um, a you know, an error in the measurement. But if I look at somebody's uh, blood pressures in the emergency room and I see hypotension once, I'm probably gonna pay attention and, and try to figure out what's going on and definitely gonna get a lactate. Because then if I get a lactate and hypotension, I know that I've gotta pay attention to that patient. Elevated lactate, hypotension. So, back in 2001, if you remember the sepsis two definitions came out in 2001. This is a landmark article that came out uh, in critical care, and actually out of the ED. So, how many people have heard of this study? Hopefully, quite a few, right? Um, Manny Rivers is the first author in this paper. Paper. He's an ED physician, and he worked at Henry Ford Hospital. And he was not satisfied with how they were taking care of patients with sepsis. Thought there could be a way to do it better. So he thought, well, if they come in, we probably ought to treat them earlier, treat them more aggressive, and we should probably find a protocol to do it, and 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 have a goal how we're going to treat these patients. So he developed what's called early glow directed therapy, EGDT um, therapy. This is basically the, the protocol. Um, I took this, I actually developed this for another hospital when this came out. Um, and, and basically it was, it was two parts to the protocol. There's the three hours and the six hour bundle. We were trying to do it two and four. But it, basically the patient came in, would get assessed for sepsis using SERS criteria. Um, you would get the blood cultures if there was suspicion of infection. And if there was no sepsis, or it was, if they had organ dysfunction or greater than four, uh, 
they would be considered severe sepsis or septic shock. At that point, they would get fluid bolus, they get broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, we would, at our hospital, activate a code sepsis, and then we would transfer the ICU. And this is what the protocol from the early goal directive would basically be, is that they would put a central line in most of those patients. Some of those patients, or, or almost all of those patients got what was a central line that did continuous SVO2 monitoring. And their goal was to get that greater than 70. So they would all get fluids. The CVP goal was greater than 8, MAP goal greater than 65, and SVO2 goal was greater than 70. And they had fluid boluses that would be given, um, Pressors. They would even give dobutamine as if the SVO2 was less than 70 in these patients. And if the crit was less than 30, they would give back red blood cells. Um, very intensive protocol. Okay. And the, for this paper, it was all done in the emergency room. They're at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, which is an inner city hospital, big, huge place. Um, they couldn't get patients to the ICU fast enough. They were taking care of patients in the hallways and they were running this protocol basically in the emergency room. So, what, what, when they did that and compared it to what they usually did, they saw a big change. So mortality in the hospital, they were about 48% mortality in usual care, with early goal directed therapy went down to about 30. Huge change just by running this protocol. And it stayed that way all the way out to 60 days. So 42% decrease in relative risk of in-hospital and 28-day mortality, and 33% risk decrease in relative risk of death in 60 days. Number needed to treat to prevent one death, six patients. There is nothing in medicine that is this good. I don't care, aspirin for a heart attack, you, you do, and by the way, when you're taking a patient in the cardiac cath lab, does that change mortality in those patients? It's a loaded question, right? No. It changes some of the outcomes, but it doesn't necessarily change mortality. So uh, TPA and stroke, not anywhere close, number needed to treat. And there's a debate about, again, that doesn't actually change uh, mortality. So it changes outcomes. So more fluid was given in the first six hours and then less need for subsequent mechanical ventilation. So, early goal-directed therapy, what they saw versus control, sudden cardiovascular collapse was less in the early goal-directed therapy, and multi-system organ failure was also less in the control group. Fluids in these patients, you saw um, more fluids given in the first six hours in the early goal-directed therapy, and then less in the first three days. But overall, they're pretty similar, not, not a huge difference. The early goal-directed therapy, um, hold on one second. okay, there we go. So early goal-directed therapy, these are sepsis patients with lactate greater than four or blood pressure less than 90 after fluid administration. So the control group and the early goal-directed therapy group, the control group still had goals of CVP, MAP, They'd use fluids and they'd use vasopressors. It just wasn't the same uh, process. In the early goal-directed therapy, the only thing they added in there was that protocol, but then also a goal for a SVO2 greater than 70 using transfusions and WB. So 49 versus 33% were the numbers from the study, the mortality. And again, the control was do whatever you normally do, and the early goal-directed therapy was uh, a pretty intensive treatment plan. We are attending to residents, three nurses, things that we can't do, right? So people automatically, when this paper came out, said, we can't have that many people. We're not a big teaching center. Can we do it um, uh, differently and still get the same results? So they, multiple trials have come out since then. Um, this is just a summary of some of them. The key here is that, uh, what other places did, they didn't necessarily follow the protocol to, to the letter, but they would do a lot of the things from the protocol. And what every one of them saw was a decrease in absolute mortality when they instituted some sort of process 
to, to get better at taking care of substance. And a lot of it is screening, education, and having a protocol. That's the kind of the thing that goes between all these studies. So, do what you normally do, and we'll be watching you, which is in this study, or screening protocol education initiative shock team treatment protocol. So they had four. Even though people knew people were watching, introduction of a protocol improved in patients that came into the ER with, with shock, improved the mortality from 40 to 28 percent. Okay, so you can't just tell people to do a better job. You have to have a system in place. And where it made a difference, especially in, in septic patients, was fluids, earlier fluid administration, okay? And so this is the group that got fluids, two hours and 35 minutes versus five hours and 46 minutes in the uh, do whatever you wanna do group. Um, intensive survival or management, or it was earlier. Um, and then also uh, antibiotics, six hours versus four hours. Still not great, I'll tell you. I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't necessarily these days publish the data that it would cost taking four hours to give antibiotics to patients who were in shock. Um, that could get you in trouble. Um, so intervention time, basically, again, is what you saw was that it got better, okay? And hospital mortality in these patients improved. The sooner you got stuff into them, fluids, central line, and then uh, uh, time to stay at a shock alert, mortality went down. If you waited, even 30 to 90 minutes, you can see the mortality go up, okay? One of the biggest things was antibiotics in this one. Time to antibiotic administration, if it was under two hours, their mortality was significantly less. Any questions on that? Would you relate the, the power of the antibiotic administration just to the exponential growth of the of yeah, when you look at all the sepsis data that's all that's been put out there, is that antibiotics is probably the most important thing to do first when a patient comes in sick. Is give them, and they and you think they're infected, is get them antibiotics as quickly as possible. So, um, and probably because at that point they're showing up to the ED and their their bacterial load is going up really really fast and toxins and those kind of things. And so if you can get that first dose in before they produce, have too many bacteria to, to, to overcome, you're gonna have better outcomes. So, now, we would like to get blood cultures for the antibiotics, but don't hold antibiotics to get blood cultures. You can't get blood cultures. I remember I sat, I admitted a patient one time, not here, um, at another institution, and ordered antibiotics, ordered blood cultures, and eight hours later, and this patient was clearly septic. I mean, on pressors, got in the fluids, everything done except nobody gave the antibiotics because they couldn't get they couldn't get the lab to come up with the uh, blood cultures. That was a problem. That patient died. So, and uh, it started, and that's when we started in that hospital. That's when we started to institute all of this, and we use that as a, a, a case to make our point. So, again, a standardized order set for the management of bacteremic severe sepsis, uh, just putting an order set in, not even really having a protocol, just an order set that's standardized. You see a D, the, your probability of remaining alive once they put in one order set improved outcomes. Okay. And that order set includes the fluids and antibiotics in yeah. that study? Yeah. No, yeah, it's just getting it done. Just you know, I try to I try to tell people, and I, I tell the ED docs, I tell hospitals, they're like, just use the order set because it will improve outcomes. That's what that data shows. So don't think, not yeah, just do it. There's no thinking. Um, so these are three trials that came out in 2016, uh, and this is an interesting. And if you've heard of these trials you'll hear many people interpret them differently, depending on what your point of view is. So with that early goal-directed therapy, 